My name is Benny Yap. As, as you see on the slide, I represent the Cisco Supply Chain Operations Group. And uh, I'm a senior technical leader, and what we're working on really is about you know, supply chain and manufacturing innovations. And today I'm going to take you on a journey, uh, a digital journey, if you will, where we're going to share with you how our digital journey starts off with a model-based definition uh, concept. And ultimately, we see a vision where it goes to a model-based enterprise where everything is digitally operated uh, to support the product lifecycle. Okay? So you guys are from Silicon Valley, most of you, so you probably know who Cisco is, uh, but we'll just recap quickly. Uh, you know, going back to the history, 1984 is when it was founded by Len and Sandy uh, from Stanford. It was a lab experiment, and it connected the networks, and here we are. And last fiscal year, which ended last July, we... Uh, made a revenue of about $48 billion, and we have about 73,000 employees plus worldwide with R&D centers in Asia, uh, Europe, as well as US. And what, are, what do we build, right? You guys know of us as the router pipeline people from the 20 years ago, but we do much more than that, right? Uh, we just recently launched the uh, Network Intuitive, and then we also deal with telepresence. So Security is big, connectivity is big, IoT is big for us, right? So the automated uh, self-driving cars is also IoT-based, so we're working on those things as well. So we're kind of everywhere that needs to be connected. Uh, and then what is our culture? Uh, so since you know, the, uh, the late 90s, we've acquired actually over 200-plus companies. I think we're 202 on the last announcement. So you can imagine in the last 20 years, we have over 200 cultures coming in. So we are a hodgepodge of startups, right? I mean, we joke internally that we are uh, a clearinghouse for startups that run on their own, right? So the, you can see the challenge of taking this journey as well. So if we could do it, anyone else can. Okay, so how does it start, right? Everybody has aspirations on you know, digital supply chain, uh, factory to future, uh, you know, manufacturing Ford Auto. So we had the same visions as well. And what we started out was with, uh, we call the factory to future, like a lot of people did. And we want to look at what 2025 seems to be the magic number today. Mark talked about that as well. What does the factory and supply chain look like in 2025? How will we be building things, right? 3D printing's coming around, uh, digitization, IoT, what does it look like? Well, you know, there's many uh, prescribed concepts and how do you approach it, and this is really how we decide to start it off. So let's start with the very beginning, right? So manufacturing exists because of some service or product that needs to be uh, delivered to consumer, right? So with a product-based company, let's start off with the design side of things. A product is concept, conceived, and designed, and then really, how do they share that information? A lot of times, a lot of people are still on this, is using 2D analog methods, right? Whether it's a 2D drawing, uh, spreadsheet, sometimes PowerPoints, you know, napkins or what have you, right? That's how we translate the design intent and the requirements to the manufacturing, okay? So how do you get to digital supply chain when you're actually using 2D drawings, right? So there's a lot of manufacturing 4.0 and, you know, uh, industry 4.0 that automate the factory, right? So a lot of automated processes, inspection, things like that. But there's still that chasm between design engineering and manufacturing, right? There's still that manual approach that we, you know, manufacturing engineer exists for some reasons to work with design engineers and so forth, right? So how do you get to this digital supply chain? So, well, this is, this is true. It's funny, but it's true. We do the sneaker net, right? Someone ties on a sneaker from the factory, runs to the design team if they open the door, and go, hey, what's going on? You can't do this. This is terrible. We can't build this. The so designer goes, go away. Kick them out the door. They come back to the factory and say, okay, we're getting this. So the sneaker net, it's not just the manufacturing aspect, but PLM side. How do you translate design documents from CAD to your PLM? There's a sneaker net to check files in to create the bomb and all that. So this sneaker net is huge, right? This is the chasm we're talking about. Then this sneaker net is the analog approach. So it breaks this so-called digital thread or digital twin that you've been hearing about the last, you know, probably the last two years and here as well. So how do we solve that? So one aspiration that we have is to bring the factory closer to the designer by reducing that chasm, right? And also digitally connecting the systems so that the factory, in a sense, 
is next to the designer, and they're promoting whatever they need to directly to the factory. That's an ideal state, right? Get rid of the chasm, bring it closer together, and then everything else you do, like DFX, design for manufacturing, design for tests, design for assembly, becomes integrated with the design approach. So now you have this thing we call development supply chain. You know, supply chain traditionally is seen as fulfillment, right? Delivery or something. Well, there are some organizations that do this well, and some organizations that are aspiring to do it. But development supply chain is really moving the factory closer to the designer and integrating manufacturing requirements into the product. And you hear about that. This is a sneaker deck. Tell the engineer, manufacturing engineer, go sit next to the designer for a day and tell them what you need, right? The designer is going to do it or not, and you come back. That's our design for X today. So how do you do that? Well, let's start with what we found, right? Our journey wasn't that simple. As you know, we're 200 plus companies. This traffic jam really looked like how we manage a lot of our product release with the PLM and multiple files, multiple databases, multiple teams, multiple contract manufacturers, right? We're a contract manufacturing company. So this congestion is real from an operation standpoint. You guys are familiar with it. Many people going different directions with different vehicles, right, at different speeds, right? So. This is what it looked like from a platform standpoint. This was simplified. This is simplified of how we actually looked at it first. We have three CAD platforms. So we're using SOLIDWORKS, Creo, and MX. We have three PDMs, EPDM, Team Center, and Windshield. We're using Oracle Agile, right? So everything funnels through Agile. And then we have multiple thousands of contract manufacturers, so it goes back out again. So you can see this is similar to the traffic jam that you saw. Many people trying to get in to PLM different times. You have all these sneaker nets trying to load information into Oracle Agile, and you know, it's the analog approach. And then you have to disperse this to supply chain, sometimes manually, right? They get access to Agile today, but sometimes we require manual things because it's 2D drawing. So we may email it to them or something like that, right? It's not supposed to be happening that way, but we do. So here is a lower level look at the workflow. So this is Again, it's simplified, but it gives the idea of what a manual workflow looks like with multiple databases, multiple entrance point, multiple uh, design uh, platforms. So you have the design engineering sit on the left, product lifecycle. They design something. They work with manufacturing, DFX, this, whatever. You do cost analysis and so forth. You bring in supply chain because we're contract manufacturer. They look at it again. Then you, you do that all over again. Right? And you check in the files to different databases that's shared, or maybe engineering database, or agile, what have you. And then you go to manufacturing. And then it starts all over again when you do proto builds and everything. So you can see this is just like the traffic jam that you saw. Right? We do it well because obviously we're making money and we're launching products. But it's a lot of orchestration, a lot of navigation, and really a lot of tribal mastery on how to do this and do it quickly. Okay. So let's start from the even beginning of that. So how do we do this? So we'll start off looking at this in the factory future and realize that the factory can only advance as much as the tools that's given to the factory to build a given product that's required. So if you're given a 2D drawing, you're still going to need manual approach to get that information into the factory. And so you really have to look at, to the left, what does manufacturing need to improve the processes, to digitalize the process, right? To digitize uh, the product. So we look up front to the left, and it's no longer now a factory of future. It's now looking at digital design and manufacturing platform. So we expanded the scope. After about half a year, we realized, we're, well, we can't really go so far as what's being tossed to us. So we start looking at it, and then we came upon a concept, which we knew about in 2003, but it wasn't so developed then. It was merely just 3D annotation. It's called model-based definition. So I'll give you a little uh, history about it if people have not seen this before in this first time. Model-based definition, we will call MBD. Model-based enterprise, which uses the model to run operations, is MBE. In 2003, ASME released a spec called the 14.41. And it is a digital annotation protocol to tell you how you annotate and dimension a part in 3D without generating 2D drawing. This was back in 2003. And it caught our eye to think, well, maybe this is something we could do because it's paperless. You know, the green factor, right? We don't print things anymore back then. But then there wasn't a lot of support, so we sort of let it sit. 2009, the DOD 
released a new spec appending to 1441. Their own spec is an open spec called mil spec 31,000. And that's when the DOD requir required all their supply chain dealing with defense to move towards MBD. 2009, they mandated, they put their foot on the floor, right? And said, you shall move towards MBD. So going now for 2012, they released an update. So you can see it's gaining more support to do this. And the first large project that's been proven is the USS Gerald Ford, the, the Ford class uh, aircraft carrier. It's the very first aircraft carrier totally designed digitally, totally managed digitally using MBD and MBE. And that's the first. It was a commission, I believe, last year. So all the DOD parts are now going to be designed and managed through MBD and MBE. So there's the legs are coming in, right? So we start looking at this three years ago and realize there's this infrastructure that's supporting it now, right? We're no longer alone. You heard about Mark's uh, opening today. You can't do this alone. You have to do it with partners. You have to do it with, you know, leverage technology. So going to the overall vision, this is really our vision, is this digital platform where in the center is this digital container. Some will call it technical data package. Some will call it digital twin. But the container seems more um, comprehensive to us. It is a container that contains all the digital requirements of that product, whether it's dimension, quality requirements, you know, in the future, attributes, quality attributes, lead time, and so forth, that you will see glints of our exploration. And then in this digital container, we'll be the digital platform that moves this digital container, not just downstream to the factory. It is also enabled to move attributes and information upstream directly to engineering. This is how we bring the factory to the engineer, right? It's not just publishing something and pushing to manufacturing. How does manufacturing communicate back to engineering through this digital platform? And then below, you see this digital cloud content management. Now, that's a stretch of a vision, but we see it coming true with all this additive manufacturing, this uh, subtractive manufacturing that's coming online where you can't scan a 2D drawing to have it printed. You have to input a model. And if you shorten that pipeline, you can send something directly to a 3D printer in someone's house and have it printed, right? It's like Star Trek stuff. This is not science fiction. It is happening, but the infrastructure is not quite there yet. So we also see a flexible platform that requires a digital platform to enable and feed it, right? Therefore, this PLM thing that we're going to talk about a little bit as well. So then what happens? The outcome is this, right? This is the outcome that we're moving towards, where you saw this web of interaction between manufacturing and design and the operations of the life cycle. Now it becomes a simplified workflow, where if everything's digital and automated downstream, you can now move your resources to the front and really sit with the engineer and really get the information and the requirements in there up front. And you're designing digitally, so you're no longer sneaker netting it. Everybody's in the same platform, getting the same information up front, right? And then you're pushing your data both ways, down and back, digitally, the digital platform, right? And your contract manufacturer is also involved with the connected supply chain as well, with IoT and everything in the future, or if you're not doing it already. Therefore, you're really getting this comprehensive data lake using this digital container to define the product. So what does it look like? Um, Architecture, right? I'm going to talk a little about architecture. So there's four stacks to architecture. So the first stack that we decided to build upon is the digital platform. You cannot move something without the means to move it. So this digital platform is the pipeline that connects our engineering PDM system. We decided to move to one and have multiple CAD systems still coming into one PDM system on the engineering side because we, we don't want to ruffle engineering's feathers by moving them to a different system. And we connected it to our manufacturing agile PLM system on the back end using a software called Zero Weight State, which they're here today, uh, Design State by a company called Zero Weight State, so you could visit them. So now they're connected, we can now pipeline the digital information through the bridge, right? Uh, so this is the start of it. This is how we move the information, and back as well. Then the next step is now that we have digital platform, we have data moving back and forth, let's automate the DFX portion. Can we create algorithm or leverage third-party software to do embedded DFX in the CAD system? So you're no longer sneaker netting as well. You are now managing the rules and configuration instead of convincing someone to do it. You're building it into the system. So it's to design something, real-time, you can get a cost, you can get DFM, DFA, uh, tolerance analysis, quality analysis, all within the same platform. Because now, now you're moving data back 
right, from the factory, connect the supply chain with IoT, can move quality data back, right, if you're more advanced, and feed into the design side to say, am I designing within this parameter? So that's the DFX portion of it. Now that you have this DFX and data flowing, you can now leverage the data. You can do search. You can search trends. How often are these things violated? What components are available that I can use at this reliability because of a previous product used it? So you can imagine what the BI, the business intelligence layer, is going to tell you, right? Because again, you have this digital platform. So now you can do a very comprehensive search, not just parametrically. If you're model based, you can search for features, right? You can search for surfaces, you can search for shape, size, what have you, right? And you can move the data between engineering and manufacturing. You're no longer just searching for things in manufacturing. Now you can search across your platform. How powerful is that? Then you can now affect the design up front to say what component are you choosing and why are you choosing it. Here's the information. Don't choose it or do choose it. And then the last thing that we're not leaving out the table, all these intertwine and they have a place within this data, this digital platform, is flexible manufacturing. Again, you have the model. You have the model with attributes in it, like dimensions and tolerances and everything that's in, embedded in the cab. Why can't you 3D print it on premise? Right? You store it in a PLM, someone gets it, prints it. How fast is that? So that is also part of the equation from an endpoint standpoint. So you look at this, this four stack really makes up this comprehensive digital platform that we're talking about. And this is really our journey. So Going down to the 10 feet level, what does it look like? You guys probably are asking, how do we do it? So I'm going to give you an exam some examples of how it looks like. So here's a capture of the CAD screen capture, where you have a part. And when we talk about model-based definition, we're embedding all the dimensions and tolerances and material, everything directly into the CAD. So we eliminate 2D drawings, because now this is the digital platform, the container that contains everything that's in this model. And then we also... Uh, in there embed the manufacturing requirements, secondary processes, plating, heat treatment, material, region, volume, everything, right? When you have those parameterized, guess what? It's a software-to-software -software discussion now. Downstream software that does these analytics of cost knows what volume it is. It knows what material it is. So it knows what secondary process is and goes and runs the algorithm for cost. DFX, DFA, DFT. DF quality, right? You can imagine how powerful this is. This is the digital platform now going back to engineering. It's no longer just pushing down. And here's an example. I'm going to show you an output. We use Anarch to convert to a technical data package using a 3D PDF right now. Uh, and I'm going to open a example just to run you through. Again, you guys are probably all interested in the detail. And you can visit them in the pavilion area. This is the security. So this is Adobe Reader. It's a free reader, right? Adobe 9 or greater can just open this. Okay, so you can see I am rotating this. This is PDF, and I opened it in an Adobe Reader. So PDF, Adobe has developed a 3D capability in the PDF. Anybody can open PDF. So I don't care what your supply chain is at right now, they can open this. If they're getting a the 2D drawing, they can open this. So you see I can rotate it. I can zoom in, zoom out, which I won't do because I don't have my mouse. All the views that I created on my MBD is here. The pros process attachments of specs are attached because I selected it early on in the CAD, and it's grabbing the latest spec from our PLM system and posting it in here. So you're starting to see the connectivity capability that you can now start to do. It's also connected to our change order management. So in here is a change order number. I can click it. It'll take me straight to the PLM marker to tell me what it is. And there's traceability going back to the CAD as well from an Agile because of the connected bridge. So I know what file I release and when, what version. So there's no more, did you give me the right file? It's right here, right? So this is the digital connectivity we're talking about, going back and forth, okay? I'm going to open up another one, and this assembly. And this is, gets more interesting. So here you see an assembly. Um, so we're doing both part and assembly. Again, here's the assembly. You notice all the dimensions came over, just like the cat. So this is an essentially, essentially a digital twin. We're just using it as a technical data package. You can use it for service that you saw earlier, and so forth. So in here, the assembly tells you what the bills of materials are and highlights whatever I click. So no longer am I having this ambiguous disconnect from the bomb to the design. Design really dictates the bills of material. And this directly goes into our PLM system. 
we have just launched to production last December a uh, router. So with assembly, sub-assemblies, and everything else. And we have a large-scale product that's going through right now without any problems. Uh, you generate these 3D at that level? All, all the way up to the top assembly level. That's the PDF, but it doesn't stop there, right? So that's just a technical data package. Uh, what we continue to realize as we take this journey is the connectivity, right? So we use uh, Design State by Zero Waste State. They're also here. Go visit them in the pavilion. So because we're connected windshield to Agile, we can now uh, promote these files digitally. No, we got rid of the sneak internet, right? So now you simply go to windshield, choose which files, which documents you want to translate over, and move over. If you want to transfer a whole bomb, one click, the whole bomb moves over. You want to move all the attached doc, uh, models and PDFs, one click, everything moves over. And it knows where to put it, so you're no longer trying to configure the bomb. It is as designed. So there's no mistakes. That gets rid of human errors too, right? Math hatching. Oh, you structured this wrong. I didn't mean it that way. My model says this. Well, you reduce some of that errors as well. Okay? So this is really nice. So this is also what allows us to connect the attributes back to, to the CAD system. And then lastly, the supply side. So we've been talking internal operations. Now what we're going to generate now with the same model, the MBD model, is a quality information framework file format. This is a new standard, not new new, but like three years new, and it's supported by National Institutes of Standards and Technology, the NIST team. So the government is, again, investing in this because they know this is where the uh, competitive front for us, for, for, you know, for, uh, for the U.S. Is, is developing things like that, right? So quality information framework is, again, a digital twin, but with focus on the quality requirements now, right? You're filtering out a lot of the material information and everything else, but keeping the tolerances requirements, the you know, co uh, cosmetic requirements, and any quality inspection things in here. If you notice, it's a one-for-one. -one. The same dimensions come over, but now it's populated in the bills of characteristics below, where now a manufacturer knows what to measure, what to maintain, and it is model based. So they're no longer translating 2D drawings that, oh, uh, I think they need to do this, right, and mark it up and go to a spreadsheet, download it. They're interacting with the 3D model directly. That it came directly from the CAD as a digital twin. Supply inputs this, sends it back to us, we get this rendition of the quality compliance within minutes. Right. No longer are we fidgeting with spreadsheets, no, we're looking at numbers, we're looking at the model and understanding what feature really is going to shut us down. Right. This is the digital container I'm talking about, it's a one-stop shop. And a lot of uh, inspection companies like Zeiss and Michitoyo are already adopting QIF in their CMM machines, where you can actually input the QIF directly into their software, it will capture this information and then measure those things automatically for you without human translation getting it straight into this, coming back to us. This is the power of the digital thread that we're talking about, right? But you've got to have this connected digital platform to move the digital thread across. So where do we go? Where do we go from here, right? It seems like we've done a lot, but we're not done yet. And this is really the larger vision, right? Looking at MBD, it enables MBE, which then enables the digital supply chain, fully enabling it. So you, we really have to look at the restrictions of our PLM system within a confined on-prem standpoint. So we use 3D PDF today, you see on the left, right? We're generating it in our PLM system. The future, you guys are hearing IoT, HTML, cloud, web-based. That's really where we see things going as well. Now, is it ready tomorrow? Probably not, right? That's something that we're looking at to see. Uh, the development and you know, leveraging all the smart people. Other, you know, I'm not the smartest guy here, so there's smarter people out there. Leveraging their concepts. And then moving to an HTML5 base uh, collaboration platform. And what that gives you is now you're no longer confined in the constraint of your on-prem system. You can now bring in IoT. You can use APIs now to bring in field data. You can connect to customer data, right, directly to your design file. So you're not just connecting on the back end and manufacturing it and reporting it to the engineer. You can now have this complete, comprehensive, connected system using IoT and web to now, and, and also cloud too, right? The PLM cloud that's coming. How do you manage and connect all this real-time data? That is really the key. How do you orchestrate that, right? Now longer and you're not limited by the, the constraints of your system. You can now open up based on security, of course. 
How do you want to bring in all that information? Now, as a designer, I can now get all this information real time on my CAD platform through the cloud. How powerful is that? Right? And I'll talk about collaboration. Right now, collaboration are PDFs. You send it to someone right now still. In the future, you can collaborate through the web. Right? So the MB web is something that Anarch also offers uh, that gives this potential to say, how can I now increase my collaboration speed and decrease the bureaucracy of taxing my resources to do that? So in the end, this is what we believe, at least I believe, could look like, where you still have multiple CAD systems. That's fine, because that's something that's dear to the engineer. We have one digital platform, whether it's PDM and a PLM connected or one complete platform, you have all these IoT and API connectivity to the cloud. It sits in the cloud, and you're still dealing with multiple contract manufacturers that also access clouds with multiple apps and things like that, right? So that's where we think it's going to go. But you really need to start building this digital foundation to get here, to leverage that technology. So what's the thing here? MBE, right? MBD, MBE is really our story to start with. Then that opens up a digital supply chain through IoT, right? through cloud, and through everything. Okay? Thank you. So I guess we have questions, or do we? I think we have Q&A. Yes, it is a server-based system, and it is generated by a click of a button. So you're getting rid of the 2D generation. So there's a lot of talk about, does it save me time as an engineer, right? Uh, right now, they go 2D, 3D, then they have to translate to 2D, and that takes some time, and they can make mistakes, right? Right now, they focus purely on the 3D, get the model right, get everything in there, and then push a button, the 3D PDF generates for them automatically. So we can generate it all day long as you update it, if you want. But, you know, you probably wouldn't want to do that until you're ready to publish. No, so there's a recipe, they call it, right, to generate that. So, again, uh, every company's different. So you have different templates and different requirements on your drawing. So you have to generate that recipe to say, how do you want it to look like? Where do you want it to go? How do you want it to be connected? So yeah, you have to generate the recipe. Well, that's the argument we had as well. So let's put it this way. How many times have the engineer says the design's not ready to be shared with manufacturer? I'm still twiddling with it because I don't have the 2D drawing done. I'm not, I don't have time to do the 2D drawing. So here's a 3D model with nothing on it. Your supplier's like, well, what do I do with this, right? In this case, you push a button, a 3D PDF can be generated 50% design and has everything that they need in there for the supplier to go look at it without getting your CAD, right? So there's an argument for that. So you can move much faster now because of that. Something broader. So they're making like they're supposed to today, but there's a lot of human translation. Let's say first article inspection for one, right? You guys are familiar with it. There's a 2D drawing base. They look at the drawing and, and, uh, gen and uh, sort of identify the dimensions they need to measure. They take that to the QC department. QC department sets up the CMM, looks at the drawing, and sometimes they don't get it, they go to the CAD model. They'll look at it, and then they try to correlate it. Then they'll measure it, boop, 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 boop. They measure a sample. Then they go to the spreadsheet, they log it in, right? Then they look at the spreadsheet, and they look at numbers, see what's non-conforming. Then they clean up the data. Then they send it back to you, right? So that's the analog piece. So one aspect of digital is they take the model in a QI form, download it completely into your CMM machine. Nobody touches it. The model you saw has been tabulated with all the requirements in there. The CMM software reads it. CMM, let's say it's an automatic CMM that they do have. It goes to measure it because the boundary conditions are all there because it's a solid model. Right? It knows how to move it, right? Everything's input it into the same software that gets in. The software gets sent to us digitally. That's why I'm talking about digital supply chain. So the digital means of uh, supporting the life cycle. Right? That's just one aspect of it. Imagine quality management, right? You have a quality event. You saw, I think, uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys saw the digital twin presentation today. It's actually quite powerful to say, if you have a digital twin of the copy of the model, let's say you give it a service. Now they're looking at a product, let's say through AR, VR, you have to have the model to look at it and superimpose the model onto the real product. Then you can now have instructions that's digitally embedded into the model that you overlay onto the real product, right? The service can now look inside product without looking inside the product, looking inside digitally to see what's behind us, and how do you remove that. So that's also digital, right, in that sense. So you're operating digitally. No longer are you opening up a 2D drawing and using screwdrivers and looking at things first before you know what's going on. Does that make sense? So it's not just a supply chain, it is the MBE aspect of it, model-based enterprise. Okay. So it is really broad, it is so broad it's 
kind of scary sometimes. Right, so where do you start? So, you know, our tolerance ranges are in there, um, and then our supply gets it, then you don't have to guess anymore, right? And they have the model. They can spin that QIF model too. So, and it highlights what surfaces to be measured. You can explore it. And it's a digital twin, so your CAD model tree is stripped out of the IP of how it was created, but the model tree, like plain datums definitions, do translate. So it is the same definition for that product. So now you have traceability, right? They can say, hey, this datum, blah, 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 on your model is a little funny. Then you can go back to your model and change that datum. Yeah, we're doing that today. We have eliminated, uh, the programs that have adopted this have eliminated assembly drawings completely. So the, it's, a, it's an all in the modeling. So the model practice has to meet your requirements. So there's a bit of a model discipline as well. So it's not free for all. You have to create you know, layers and manage your sub-assemblies and how you want it to be done. So there's some constraints there, right? So garbage in, garbage out, right? So, and sometimes they could model things that they don't mean to re report, and that could be garbage too. So, so it's the modeling practice, yeah, but you can do it. It depends on how you want to sequence your sub-assemblies in your model. So, but we, yeah, the, those programs, we don't release any 2D drawings anymore, completely 3D. And on the supply chain, love it, right? Because now it's clear. They're not interpreting anymore. Oh, uh, someone back there, I saw. So we're moving into that as well. Again, this is not limited to electromechanical parts. Um, anything that's physically modeled, you can probably bridge that gap by connecting them, right? So even PCB, you have components, right? Like ECAD right now, you have Cadence, and using Allegro doesn't jive with the MCAD, right? Uh, so the CAD companies are you know, working on that right now, where they are eventually going to be managed through a system. It's no longer mechanical, electrical, which we do today. It really should be managed from a system level that gets the product through this digital platform. So it's the same concept. It shouldn't be limited to just mechanical. It, it may look different, right? Not IoT yet, but we're using it to manage our life cycle. Well, that depends. I'm going to put the pressure on the Oracle. That depends on how well they do the PLM and the cloud, right? So, I mean, you can only get so far with the platform that's closed, right? So it depends on what they do is how we move to it. I mean, right now it's not something we're gonna do tomorrow, but it's something that, that's why I'm here talking to you guys because as a community, we can push the providers to give us what we want, right? I mean, it's not just giving up the farm, it's really driving this consensus, say, yeah, that makes sense, I also want it, and you know, that's how the support comes in, right? Uh, or else you're alone and you can't do this alone, or you're, you have deep pockets like what Marco's talked about. You know, do everything internally. It's not the right thing to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.